This is the U.S. Report with James Morrow. Good evening and welcome to the program. Coming up tonight, Joe Biden's Baltimore blooper. You'll never guess the bizarre lie he told to connect himself to that bridge disaster. Plus, Trump gets the last laugh putting up cash for his New York bond after a share float makes him a billionaire. Plus, we'll analyze the latest polling and what Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is doing to Joe Biden. But first, I think we need to talk a bit more about that massive disaster in Baltimore this week, which saw a Singapore-flagged cargo ship take out one of the pylons of the Francis Scott Key Bridge that crosses the port of Baltimore, bringing it down, collapsing it into the icy waters below. Now, if you ask me, this is an event, a tragedy, that resonates so much because it seems to crystallize the general feelings of so many that America is in decline, that performative wokeness is more important than actual performance, and that everything is coming apart at the seams. It's a vibe that is sort of like Robert De Niro's Taxi Driver, but where the big concern is pronouns, not prostitution. Now, let's be really clear here before we go any further. I do not think that wokeness, per se, caused the Francis Scott Key bridge disaster. The experts will hand down their verdict in due time, but the most likely explanation is probably shoddy maintenance on the ship and a crummy crew. We'll see. This is, of course, despite the fact that plenty of other transport problems, such as the tendency of Boeing airliners to lose doors mid-flight, can probably be at least partially sheeted home to that company's cultish adoption of DEI practices, which, let's just hope, do not cause one or more people to D-I-E one of these days. And in fact, I'm really concerned that the entire Biden administration is so shot through with wokeness that America's infrastructure will continue to decay, whether due to shipping accidents or train derailments or God knows what else. Let's remember, this here is the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg. He is a man who thinks a highway can be racist, even if it's never sent out a spicy tweet in its life. If an underpass was constructed such that a bus carrying mostly black and Puerto Rican kids uh, to a beach, or there would have been, uh, in New York was, was designed uh, too low for it to pass by, but that obviously reflects racism that went into those design choices. Um, I don't think we have anything to lose by confronting that simple reality, and I think we have everything to gain by acknowledging it and then dealing with it. Of course, Buttigieg also drives an electric Mustang, which pretty much tells you everything else you need to know about the man. Meanwhile, to focus back on ports for a moment, what are they teaching in America's Merchant Maritime Academies? Well, here's what's going down at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy, where according to their website, they are teaching students who will go on to crew and run America's commercial ships and ports about allyship leading across cultures, diversity, culture, and inclusive leadership. The Academy's website that the training ends is something called a raccoon circle exercise, which, I don't know, never heard of it before, but it may or may not have something to do with furries. Those who complete the training also get a safe harbor sticker to put up in their office too. Gosh. Meanwhile, at the New York Maritime College, their strategic plan devotes pages and pages to diversity and inclusion. And well, you know what, we could go through all of them, but you get the idea. And let's also not forget that the Biden administration has put wokeness, progressive left green thinking, front and center in all of its signature infrastructure programs, as the great Terry McCran has explained previously. There are all sorts of woke spending yes. programs that are involved in that spending. You know, the sort of things that people might think of as infrastructure, like roads and schools and hospitals, uh, maybe maybe half at tops is going to be spent on those mm. things. The rest of the money is going to be spent on all sorts of uh, social welfare and uh, woke programs. Mm. 
Pete Buttigieg has also said that the infrastructure bill would spend billions on transformational infrastructure projects across the nation. But what, in fact, this turned into was trillions spent on all sorts of nonsense, including an obsession with the Marxist code word equity, the advancement of an anti-car agenda, and the hyper-woke Digital Equity Act. But anyway, back to the future. And as with so many other transportation disasters, the president is nowhere to be seen. Just as he took 378 days to visit the scene of the infamous East Palestine, Ohio train derailment, there's no indication of when the president will go to survey the wreckage that has shut down one of America's biggest ports. Any update on when the president would go to Baltimore? I don't have an update for you. Obviously, we want to do we want to do it when it is the appropriate time on the ground. Uh, we're going to continue to have conversations with uh, obviously uh, local uh, of, uh, officials on the ground uh, to get uh, to get a sense of what their needs are. Uh, but we want to make sure that we do not disrupt their efforts. Hmm. Indeed. Oh, and one more thing. You reckon that if they do rebuild that bridge, they'll name it after Francis Scott Key again? He was the guy, of course, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner? Not on your life. The Washington Post and other media outlets are already circling the wagons to cancel Key, noting Key's, quote, conflicted relationship with slavery. So who knows? Maybe one day your grandchildren, because that's how long it takes to build anything in the U.S. these days, We'll have the pleasure of crossing the Baltimore Black Lives Matter Bridge or the Stacey Abrams Span or, well, whatever they decide to call it. In an EV, of course. Joining me now is former White House Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor at Bondi Partners, Mick Mulvaney. Mick, let's get right into the Baltimore Bridge disaster. And I want to ask you about this, another gaffe from the leader of the free world. In an attempt to express his sadness over the bridge collapse, Biden made up a complete lie. Have a listen to this. At about 1.30, container ships struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been over many, many times commuting from the state of Delaware in our train or by car. Mick, this bridge had no train line, but this is another one of these sort of weird things where he tries to connect himself to a disaster with some weird made up personal story. Why is he lying about things like this? Yeah, James, I, I don't know if he's lying or if he's just remembering things wrong. Either way, it's not very presidential. You're right. He, 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 I guess his, his heart is in the right place. He's trying to connect with people, but he just makes stuff up. By the way, he's been famous for doing this throughout his 50-year career in Washington, D.C. I guess people have just sort of expected it from the, from him at this point. But, yeah, it's, it's, it's embarrassing to have a president of the United States who doesn't know where he's been. He doesn't know, you know, the bridges around here. It's, it's just it's added to a long list of embarrassments from the president. Absolutely shocking. Now, let's move on to other news here, because in New York, Joe Biden has just shown up in Manhattan for what they're hoping to be a $25 million fundraiser with Bill Clinton and Barack Obama which is going to feature every celebrity from Stephen Colbert to Lizzo performing there. Now, a lot of money, but the, are the Democrats, Mick, repeating their 2020 mistake of running a Hollywood-heavy campaign? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. And granted, $25 million is a lot of money to raise. It's probably going to set a record for the largest political fundraising event in, in, the, in the history of the nation. But you're absolutely right. It sounds very, very tin-eared. Plus, James, but I think a lot of people are, are, are just now starting to realize in that star-studded sort of alignment of, of all the people who were there, Joe Biden's not one of the stars. Bill Clinton will outshine him. Barack Obama will outshine him. Most of the celebrities will. He's going to be, as he has been for a long time, sort of an afterthought at his own event. So, look, they're going to raise a lot of money. That's important in this business. There's no question about it. Donald Trump has actually taken advantage of it by going to a funeral of a slain uh, policeman just on the other side of the city at the same time. So he's trying to take advantage of, of this misstep by the Democrats. At the end of the day, you know, $25 is a lot of money. Well, it is. And I mean, he's gone. Trump has gone, though, as you say, to that wake for the slain New York police officer, Jonathan Diller. He was shot and killed by a career criminal. Um, is this going to allow him then to focus on this kind of gap between the elites in their big fundraisers and everybody else who has to deal with the sort of crime and mayhem and nonsense on the streets that, of course, took this police officer's life? 
Yeah, as I'm sitting here talking to you now, the events are going on, and that's exactly the narrative you're seeing on social media, is that Joe Biden is out of touch. He's back off with his Hollywood friends. It's the liberal elites, and Donald Trump is caring about ordinary people. So again, Biden's going to make a lot of money, but I think at the end of the day, Trump will win this battle. He will win this day um, in the political battle for voters. Now, just on the subject of uh, Joe Biden and his, you know, shall we say, mental faculties, this is a fascinating thing here. White House Press Secretary Karen Jean-Pierre was doing an interview with a Baltimore, uh, sorry, a Charlotte News reporter, uh, in, and in the middle of the interview, he was asked about whether or not, she was asked about whether President Biden has dementia. Have a listen to this. When I told a number of people that I was talking to you today, it was interesting, though, they all said, would you please just ask her, does the president have dementia? And so before I move on from that, does he? That, Mark, Mark, I can't even believe you're asking me this question. That is a credibly offensive question to ask. And with that, thank you so much, Mark. Have an amazing, amazing day. Wow. Wow. And she hung up. Wow. <laughs> Mick, KJP wasn't happy there, and of course that usual thing she does where she gets all outraged that somebody would ask a question that everybody's asking. Tell us what you reckon about this. James, a couple different things. I work for that radio station. That's my hometown station. I know the gentleman who's asking those questions. He's one of the most mild-mannered, down-the-middle sort of newsmen you are ever going to, to meet, and to treat him like that, you, you sort of, you could hear the tone of her voice. It's the same sort of tone in his voice that Chuck Schumer had when he was castigating Benjamin Netanyahu last week. Democrats love to talk down to people who don't agree with them, and that's exactly what uh, Corinne Jean-Pierre said today. By the way, notice in her answer, there was a longer answer, uh, she didn't say no which I think is absolutely stunning to me. All you have to do is say, well, Mark, I'm not like the question, but the answer is no, what's your next question? But she didn't do that. So look, if, if, she were, if she were a Republican press secretary, or if he were a Democrat or a woman or an African-American, they would be calling for KJP's head today on a silver platter. They'd be demanding, the media in this country would be demanding she be fired. But you know for a fact, that's not happening. We know, we know it's not happening, and we all know why. Now, Mick, I need your help on another thing here. This is why I have you on every week, because I need your help with a lot of things. And this one here is RFK Jr.'s VP pick. It's a woman named Nicole Shanahan. She's a 38-year-old lawyer. She used to be married to the co-founder of Google. What do we know about her? And will this help or hinder the Kennedy campaign, which the poll numbers are suggesting is doing some pretty interesting things, particularly to Biden's numbers? Yeah, what, what, what do we know about her? There's one thing we need to know about her. It's the reason that uh, Kennedy picked her for vice president. She's fabulously wealthy. This is the woman who single-handedly bankrolled his ad during the Super Bowl that cost $4 million. That's why he put her on the ticket, along with the fact that I think everybody else probably turned him down. Look, here's the issue it's creating for him right now. Yes, she brings a lot of money, but the only way he's going to get on the ballot in a in a considerable number of states is by running as a libertarian. Now, he's got some libertarian sort of uh, sort of tendencies. This is a small government, civil liberties, just leave us the heck alone type of attitude. But she's not. She's a hardcore progressive left winger. And I was talking this week to the to the chairman of the Libertarian Party in this country, the woman who we have a great deal to say over whether or not Kennedy gets a place on the ballots. And what she said was, look, they were kind of okay with Kennedy, but they really did not like the Shanahan woman. So it may prevent him from even getting on the ballot. So I get come back to the, the first conversation we had. Money is important in this business, but it's certainly not everything. And, uh, you know, with that, though, tell us, there, there seems to be an effort by the Democrats to keep uh, Kennedy off of the ballot. Does this show that they're a bit nervous about what he's doing to Joe Biden's numbers? Third parties in this country, typically, they typically don't get a lot of, uh, of, of traction. You're talking about people who might pull between four and five percent of the vote. In an ordinary election, that doesn't change the outcome. In an election that's going to be as close as this one is, it could change the uh, the outcome of the election. And keep in mind that you've got a situation now where uh, just a couple thousand votes in Michigan could cost Joe Biden the election. And while Kennedy might pull from Republicans and Democrats, the tradition here is that third parties pull from the incumbent party, regardless mm. of not that's for Republican or Democrat. And that's why Democrats are slightly more concerned about Kennedy 
than the Trump team. And finally, Mick, just want to ask you about the sad news uh, this week that Joe Lieberman uh, has passed away at the age of, I believe, 82. Fascinating man, uh, the first uh, Jewish candidate for vice president, I believe, um, and also considered one of just the great, well, to use a term, menches of uh, American politics and American life. Uh, Mick, did you have any dealings with Joe Lieberman? And uh, have we sort of, is this an end of an era of that sort of politician who was so loved by so many people? I, I hope not. I, I think we're in a period of time right now where, where folks like this can't get elected, but there's no reason we can't get back to that. This was a really nice guy. He just was. He was a Democrat, one of the nicest men you are ever going to meet. I remember bumping into him in a bar in Washington, D.C. when I was a new member of Congress, and we sat and talked for 20 minutes. We worked a little bit more on the No Labels campaign. I don't work for them, but I've advised them on budgetary matters and so forth. And everybody sort of liked Joe Lieberman because he's such a good guy and a great sort of example of disagreeing with people without being disagreeable, and he will be sorely missed. Mick Mulvaney, amen to that. Thank you so much for your time, and we'll see you next week on the U.S. Report. Well, all eyes have been on Donald Trump's New York fraud case these last few weeks as Attorney General Letitia James demanded he front up a $454 million U.S. bond. Luckily for the former president, a state appeals court has tossed him a lifeline. Joining me now to discuss all of this is lawyer Robert Barnes. Robert, tell us, what is the absolute latest that's been going on with the Letitia James fraud trial? Has this now basically come to an end with Trump paying a much smaller bond on this? Uh, yes. I mean, the appeals court should have just stayed it entirely given the unprecedented and unparalleled nature of the case. It's not only unprecedented, uh, unprecedented and unparalleled to go after the uh, former president and the leading opponent of the existing president who's leading in all polls. This kind of charge has no parallel in New York's history, in any state's history, in the U.S. government's history. No, never before has somebody that had a basic loan deal with basic real estate transactions been ordered to almost bankruptcy for most normal Americans to the tune of a billion dollars was supposed to be effectively posted in order to secure the right to appeal an absurd decision that was based on ludicrous legal determinations by a politically partisan judge. So what an honest appeals court would have done would have been to stay the whole thing pending appeal. They didn't have the political courage in New York to do that. So instead, they dramatically reduced the scale of the bond. Trump was able to post it. Now it goes to the appeal stage. But I think what it sets up, along with these other cases, is that the Supreme Court of the United States needs to step in on immunity grounds to end this entire political charade of lawfare against President Trump. Well, let's have a look at Donald Trump explaining uh, how he's going to cover the bond, the new much reduced bond, particularly after his true social um, share market float, which um, earned him billions of dollars. Have a look at this. Thank you very much. What's your Does this reflect a new confidence uh, in the Trump camp that they are getting the upper hand on these, these other cases and are going to be able to stave them off until after the election? I think so. I mean, at least partially. I think what all these cases do is accelerate and escalate the pressure on the Supreme Court because the New York criminal court case continues to go forward at a rapid pace with a judge who's issuing unconstitutional gag orders, Professor Dershowitz, Professor uh, Turley, both from the Democratic side of the political aisle, have said this is unconstitutional prior restraint on the president. They're trying, that judge is trying to seal the proceedings, trying to rush the trial and, and do so with a jury venue that the proven evidence shows cannot give a fair and impartial verdict as the Constitution requires. So the, these uh, partisan uh, prosecutors refuse to stop in New York and Georgia and D.C., and that's going to bring pressure on the Supreme Court to get involved, because otherwise these are judges interfering in the American election for the 2024 presidency. Well, Robert, he's got this trial going on in New York. I think they want the trial to start on the 15th of April, which I think is in a week or so from now. I think it's two Mondays from now. How can they even get a fair jury in a city that is that nine out of 10, at least New Yorkers, voted against the man? Uh, and I mean, I'm a New Yorker. I know how people feel about Trump in that city. It seems to me like this would be, well, exactly what the framers of the Constitution wanted to avoid. 
Precisely. It's what the Constitution of both New York and the United States requires, which is an impartial jury. Uh, it's not necessarily a jury of your peers. That would be difficult in Trump's case. Uh, there's not many peers to Trump. But it does require an impartial jury, a jury that's able to weigh the facts, weigh the evidence uh, without any discriminatory or prejudicial impact. And the reality is Martin Luther King could have got a fairer verdict in 1950s all-white jury Birmingham than Donald Trump can get out of Democratic partisan New York. The data shows that. They did sophisticated independent surveys and studies presented to the court that showed that 90% or more of the jury pool has already ruled against President Trump. They cannot be impartial. And so the case should be moved out of New York constitutionally, but the partisan judge whose own family works for the Biden campaign and is getting their pockets lined by the Biden campaign refuses to either delay the case or move the trial. Well, Robert, I mean, that's just shocking stuff, those connections between uh, the judge and the Biden camp. And it goes to something that we talk about in on this program a lot. It doesn't matter whether or not you support Donald Trump or not. If you believe in the principles of fairness, you can't allow this sort of banana republic behavior to continue. But, Robert, finally, I want to ask you just a two-parter here. What is the latest on Georgia, Fannie Willis, the election interference case? And also, are things still playing out with the classified documents case as well? So the classified documents case is going to be delayed once again because of this April trial date in New York. And the, that judge has suggested that she may consider dismissal of the case or even give jury instructions that would create the effect of dismissal on the case. And that judge is still considering dismissal on immunity and other grounds. And the D.C. case is still pending before the Supreme Court of the United States on immunity grounds. The Georgia case is currently calendar to somehow go to trial right during the peak of the election, which is insane. But that, that trial court has sent it up to the Court of Appeals, which could stay the whole proceedings. What all of this is putting pressure on is the Supreme Court of the United States. The only way we quit embarrassing ourselves on a global scale in terms of uh, mocking the American legal system is if the Supreme Court of the United States steps in, grants broad immunity to the president, which the Constitution already affords him, and that would put an end to all of these cases, including the criminal case in New York. And we already saw how the Supreme Court uh, treated that case in Colorado, where they were trying to keep them off the ballot. So we'll see if they uh, maintain that sort of jurisprudence when these cases finally come to them. Trial lawyer Robert Barnes, thank you so much for your time on the U.S. Report. Now, after the break, a very special guest, Rob Henderson, author of Troubled. It's the memoir everyone is talking about. But first... Kamala Harris went to Puerto Rico this week. No, not on vacation. She was there to allegedly work, but she got a very musical welcome. Have a look at this, and if you know Spanish, don't give it away. But do watch the moment she stops clapping. <laughs> You mean they're not singing for me. Yes, that's right. The song sounded jaunty, but it was actually a protest song with lyrics criticizing her and her boss, Joe Biden. According to Newsweek, the singers were singing lines including, We want to know, Kamala, what did you come here for? We want to know what you think of the colony. Ay, caramba. Rob Henderson, next. You're watching the U.S. Report. I'm James Morrow. In a moment, I'm going to bring in Rob Henderson, who's going to tell us all about his new memoir, Troubled, and he's going to explain about the luxury beliefs of the elite that make life for everybody else miserable. But first, hey, guess who's an expert on high finance and tax law? Yeah, that's right. Comedian Jon Stewart, who is explaining to his braying audience of stone sharehouse dwellers and fiction writer workshop dropouts about why Donald Trump's supposed overvaluing of his properties was not a victimless crime. Well, you know where this is going, don't you? They are not victimless crimes. First, the banks got paid back at lower interest rates. Although, to be honest, who gives a <laughs> But second, money isn't infinite. 
A loan that goes to the liar doesn't go to someone who's giving a more honest evaluation. So the system becomes incentivized for corruption. And this is part of a different Trump fraud case, but avoiding taxes hurts all of us. Donald Trump shenanigans cost the city of New York. And to be honest, and let's be frank here, that is money that the city of New York could have used to build more Walgreens. Oh, how they laughed. But guess what? It turns out that old Mr. Stewart himself has been caught out overvaluing his New York City penthouse by 829%. He sold the thing for eight times what it was worth according to its own valuation. I don't know, John, are the walls closing in yet? You can't make this stuff up. Well, it's a real pleasure to bring you my next guest, Rob Henderson. He's the author of a new searing memoir called Troubled, a memoir of f foster care, family, and social class. And it's all about his life in foster care and how he broke the cycle of poverty and dysfunction and made a real success of himself. And he's also the man behind one of the cleverest substacks around, which you should go and check out. Rob, thanks so much for joining me. Welcome to the program. Your book is a hell of a read, and I mean this in the best way. You grew up in pretty, shall we say, distressing and chaotic circumstances. You were bounced around the foster care system, but, and there's some harrowing stuff in there. After that, though, you made it to the Air Force, Yale, Cambridge, and these educational institutions, yet you also say that education hmm. is not everything. How come? Explain that to us. Yes. Yeah. Well, well thank you, James. Um, it's great to be here. Well, you know, there's a lot of discussion about social mobility and what are the factors that give rise to social mobility. And there's a lot of emphasis on education and success, occupational prestige, future earnings, all these kinds of things. But you know, I attained those things. I achieved the sort of conventional metrics of success. Um, and yet when I dug into the data, I found that, you know, I obviously I had some intuitive sense that I am very much a sort of statistical anomaly here. But when you actually look at the research, you find that the strongest predictor of a child graduating from college is being raised by two married parents. I didn't have that. Um, and that's one reason why I'm in this sort of unique position. People can sort of understand that my story is very unusual. And instead of sort of singing the praises of education, which, you know, education is fine, it's all well and good, but I don't think this should be the, the be all and end all. We should focus more on what's happening with young people, with children before the age of 18, rather than after the age of 18. And I arrived at a lot of these ideas um, after having lived in foster homes, after having served in the military, and by the time I arrived at Yale and then later at Cambridge um, and interacting with a lot of people, uh, you know, current and future members of the ruling class, uh, policymakers, uh, cultural tastemakers and so on, I realized there's this massive disconnect between um, you know, the, the elites and and uh, and everyone else. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that you talk about is how these tastemakers and cultural elites and people who basically command the heights of the culture and policymaking, in many ways, they encourage people to do things or follow policies that are not helpful to most people, and then they go and wind up doing the opposite for themselves. Mm -hmm. In a sense, they're kind of entrenching inequality by doing this, aren't they? Yeah, well, there's this kind of, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know who coined this phrase, but it's, it captures it quite nicely that, um, you know, what I call the luxury belief class, they walk the 50s and talk the 60s, where they abide <laughs> by sort of conventional bourgeois norms. Um, you know, if you look at who's the most likely to get married, the least likely to get divorced, the most likely to uh, work hard in their personal lives and prioritize education and, and child rearing and marriage and those kinds of things, uh, these are people with college degrees who are upper and upper middle class. Um, but then if you uh, ask people about their opinions about the importance of marriage, 75% of people with college degrees say it's not important uh, if you have a child that uh, the child should be raised by two married parents. They're the most likely to say that uh, drugs should be decriminalized, that uh, we should defund the police. Um, over and over, you know, I, I document these statistics in the book that if you break down um, sociopolitical opinions by 
education and earnings, it's the people who have the most education and the highest incomes that are the most supportive of these uh, strange, newfangled, uh, and potentially socially destructive ideas. Uh, and many of these people are sheltered. You know, this this idea of luxury beliefs, ideas and opinions that confer status on the upper class while inflicting costs on the lower classes. You know, the core feature of a luxury belief is that the believer is sheltered from the consequences of his or her belief. And you see this over and over with, uh, you know, more, more, perhaps most recently, the, the defund the police movement and the movement to decriminalize drugs. Um, and you saw that in, in Oregon, where they decriminalized drugs in 2020, and now they're trying to reintroduce legislation to recriminalize them because they've realized what a catastrophic mistake that was. And I mean, Rob, is it sort of ironic then that the, broadly speaking, the left side of politics, the progressive class, you know, they've wound up embracing the the sort of a, a beliefs of the elite, which have at the same time then landed very heavily the consequences of them on the people that progressive than the left used to say that they cared about people, you know, in the working class, in the precarious middle, uh, people at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder who have to live with the consequences of family dysfunction, of drug deals happening on their street, of everything else that goes on in the schools. Yeah, you know, there's, uh, there's a mismatch between what they say they care about and what the effects of their policies and their preferences, what they have uh, on society overall. And I just think this speaks to a widening divide between uh, the elites and the masses where they spend a lot of time talking to one another. Many people with college degrees have never spent 20 minutes having a conversation uh, with someone without a college degree who works a more blue collar job who you know d doesn't spend their days um, you know reading the right op-eds and fashionable periodicals and sort of listening to the right opinions? Uh, you know what is their goal? Is it to to help the the downtrodden and the dispossessed? Um, oftentimes they spend a lot of their um, you know their educational experience and their uh, time interacting with other fellow elites who claim to speak on behalf of the dispossessed and the poor and the marginalized, uh, even though they themselves, these, these supposed uh, representatives, even though they themselves are also very well off and affluent and so on and so forth. And so I think there's um, sort of space here for mm. educated and affluent people to be more thorough in their analysis of the ideas that they promote, these, these luxury beliefs, I call them. And Rob, how has the um, has this message been received? You know, we talk about elite, elite taste making institutions like, for, for example, the New York Times bestseller list, um, which I understand that this thing has been the book has been basically sort of kept off it when it was on a lot of the other lists. And you've also noted that some bookstores have refused to have uh, or turned down the possibility of having you come and do events or feature the book uh, at their shops. Is this message that threatening? to the people who are indeed these elite tastemakers and cultural drivers and everybody else. Yeah, that, that came as a real shock to me. Uh, I wanted to do a uh, book tour. I ended up doing it anyway, but uh, it, it, we took a different avenue, but originally to speak at bookstores, bookshops, and uh, they you know, turned down uh, my requests, uh, my publishers, we attempted to arrange it. and. I was shocked by this. I didn't think the message of my book was particularly contentious. Um, it's a very straightforward argument that I think people across the political spectrum could agree upon that we should be focusing on what's happening with kids, with families in the country, people who are poor and in unstable and chaotic circumstances. Uh, and yet uh, there is there's something about this. I think the luxury beliefs idea did get under people's skin. I think people can recognize themselves in that idea and they don't like it. And it's just easier to, to you know, not, not confront it and, and to pretend it doesn't exist. Rob Henderson, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Everybody go out, buy his book, Troubled, and go find his uh, website and his Substack. It's great, fascinating reading. Now, John Fund is gonna join us in a moment, but first I want to tell you a tale of two cities and their very different law enforcement styles. First, let's go to Minnesota, where there is apparently an epidemic of car thefts because, hey, those cars were just asking for it, and it's the automaker's fault. We've also got to go upstream. We've got to make sure that the automobiles are not so easy to steal so that they're attempting attractive nuisance for young people. And, you know, right now we are investigating two major automakers because their cars are dramatically too easy to steal. 
Honestly, how were those young people supposed to resist the temptation to steal a car? Meanwhile, in Santa Rosa, Florida, the sheriff has a slightly different take. As to the person, we don't know what homeowner, which homeowner shot at him. Um, I guess they think that they did something wrong, which they did not. If somebody's breaking in your house, you're more than welcome to shoot them in Santa Rosa County. We prefer that you do, actually. Um, so whoever that was, you're not in trouble. Come see us. We have a gun safety class we put on every other Saturday. And if you take that, you'll shoot a lot better and hopefully you'll save the taxpayers money. I know where I'd rather live. Santa Rosa, here we come. John Fund after the break. Welcome back. Let's bring in great friend of the show, political journalist John Fund. John, thanks for coming on the program. Now, I want to talk to you about some of these polls which I'm seeing. A new national poll from Quinnipiac shows President Biden taking a small three-point lead over Donald Trump in a head-to-head -head race. This is a bit of an outlier, but they've got him at 48-45. But here's what's really interesting. The survey also found that the inclusion of independent and third-party candidates like RFK Jr. then winds up seeing Trump pull back ahead. Tell us, how is the Kennedy spoiler effect, John, playing out in this race? And why is it that Kennedy voters or having Kennedy in the mix is actually winding up helping Trump? I would have thought that they would have come across to Biden when the crunch comes in the ballot box? Some of them will, but remember, the key to this election, James, is just like in 2016, about a fifth of the voters hate both candidates, not just dislike or disagree with, but hate. But they're going to vote, or at least many of them will. Uh, I think that 13% that RFK has will shrink. Uh, a chunk of it will go back to Biden. A big chunk simply won't vote uh, or stay home. And second, and lastly, uh, Trump will retain a big chunk of that uh, because remember, Kennedy's strength is his campaign against the establishment. That means the status quo, or in his case, he sometimes calls it the status quo. So while Kennedy uh, does attract some anti-establishment voters, the Kennedy name is magic still with many Democrats, including minority Democrats. And many minority Democrats are disillusioned with Joe Biden, so they will gravitate and stay with RFK Jr. But how do you sort of pigeonhole RFK, or is that not possible? I mean, we were speaking before the program with the producers and saying, you know, on some things he's got some really hard left uh, opinions, you know, on the environment and things like that. On other things, he's pretty hard to the right. How do you even begin to categorize him, or is this why he's an independent? Yes, but 30 years ago, we had a candidate who was a little similar to that, named Ross Perot. Yes. Now, he wound up getting 19% of the vote, but he was a mixture of interesting issues. He was pro-choice on abortion. Uh, he was very much opposed to the debt and deficits, and that united him with a lot of conservative Democrats and also a lot of conservative Republicans. So I think that the anti-establishment flavor of RFK Jr. is what explains his appeal because both parties are in ill repute today. But now I remember Ross Perot when he was uh, out there in 1992, he put up a lot of his own money and he was really quite a force there. RFK though, there seems to be a real effort to kind of squelch his um, profile, I think, in the media and elsewhere. And I've noticed about that- smash like a bug. <laughs> yeah, smash like a bug. Well, including also they're trying to keep him off the ballot in states like Nevada. Does that show that they are really concerned now about, uh, in the Democrat camp, about RFK siphoning off votes from Biden when he's clearly going to need every vote he can get if he's going to have a chance to pull this off in November? You know, it is interesting. The Democratic theme this year is democracy is on the ballot. Yeah. And we have to save our democracy. I don't know how you save the democracy by limiting people's choices, by launching lawfare lawsuits uh, to force uh, a former, uh, you know, major figure in the Democratic Party off the ballot. It sounds to me like it's a lot about we're in charge, we're a political machine, and we're not going to give you any choices. 
Yeah, no, it's, uh, I've noticed that sort of irony about the people who seem to want to sort of destroy democracy in order to save it. But the other thing, too, that they talk about a lot, or they used to talk about a lot, was Bidenomics. But apparently it's not that big a hit with the electorate because an analysis has found that the president and his party have almost completely stopped using the word Bidenomics. There's a chart on the screen there that shows the number of mentions per month, and it's barely anybody's using the phrase anymore. Have they finally realized that this idea is a complete dud? Well, what they have realized is that people in the lower income categories um, who aren't in the stock market, which is certainly up, uh, they're suffering day to day. If they were living paycheck to paycheck, they still are paying a lot more in inflation than they want to or can remember doing. Uh, the interest rates on their car, the interest rates on their house uh, are higher than they've been in years. So if you're in the stock market, if you're in the urban centers of New York and Los Angeles and Chicago earning a good income, you're doing fine. But a lot of people are struggling and they don't believe Bidenomics is anything but a gun pointed at their heads. Yeah, I kind of feel like whenever you put anomics on anything, you know, it's a bit of a dangerous thing to do. Um, John, I spoke earlier in the show about the bridge collapse uh, and the incident in Baltimore. And of course, you know, we're all thinking of the families of those who lost their lives in that disaster. But you've pointed out that this might also be a wake up call around infrastructure and building rules in general. Tell us a bit more about this. America used to be known for building things fast and well. Uh, the Empire State Building went from a hole in the ground to uh, being launched and opened for business in 14 months. Uh, today, we just had last week the final environmental impact statement for the rebuilding of Union Station in Washington, D.C. It only took nine years. Uh, construction and everything else and planning it will now take another 14 years. It'll probably open in 2040. This is pathetic. All over the world, people build things faster and better than we do. We have Davis-Bacon wage laws that uh, basically are a subsidy to the unions. They raise the cost of it. Uh, we have the environmental protection laws, which drag on forever and invite lots of lawsuits. Uh, we're a laughing stock in the world. In New York City, where I'm sitting right now, uh, we took 20 years to build a 1.6 mile extension of one subway line. In Paris, they've already opened three lines in that period of time. Well, John, sometime you'll come to Sydney and I'll show you the Sydney light rail and you won't believe how long that took to build. But thank you so much for your time, You're learning John. from us, unfortunately. <laughs> thank you, John. Only in America is next. But first, speaking of America, Philadelphia was once known as the birthplace of American independence but now it's fallen on hard times. Yet, now that the city has all but gone broke, the city fathers, or rather, sorry, the city gender neutral carers have decided to go woke. Check out the new tourism ad Philadelphia is running, because of course the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution had so much to do with drag queens. <laughs> Hey, look at clumsy Gerald. The animals all sneered. Giraffes can't dance, you silly fool. Oh, Gerald, you're so weird. Excuse me, coughed the cricket. Who'd seen Gerald earlier on. But sometimes when you're different, you just need a different song. They shouted, it's a miracle. We must be in a dream. Gerald's the best dancer that we've ever, ever seen. Tell you what, Thomas Jefferson may have worn a wig, but I reckon a frock was completely out of the question. Only in America in a tick. And now it's time for a little segment we like to call Only in America. Let's head to Dallas right now to hear a professional gambler named Tiny tell the local city council about his foolproof system for winning bets and plead with local legislators to legalize his work. Because, well, you'll see. Oh, and since this video was posted by a great friend of this program, Alex Stein, well, I think you might know where this is going. Yo, Urban City Council, how you doing? My name is Tiny, and I'm a professional sports gambler. But unfortunately, my career 
is at a standstill because I got six baby mamas all in the DFW Metroplex. So I can't live in a state that's got legal gambling in a sense it will be March Madness. I'm coming up here to beg y'all to make sports gambling legal in the city so I can stack my paper and pay for the illegitimate, illegit illegitimate children. I know some people think sports betting is risky, but I got an unbeaten system that can put money in all y'all pockets. Seriously. I also got a sports betting angle that's foolproof. Since y'all want to let these all these transgenders up in the league, that is full proof. Since y'all want to let all these transgenders up in the league, I became almost a millionaire betting on Leah Thomas's big ass winning all them swimming meets. And just like these transgender swimmers, my swimmers are strong. That's why I got so many baby mamas. But you know what that means? I got a lot of bills to pay, so I'm sick of risking my life and my freedom on gambling illegally on transgender athletes. So I beg you, Irving City Council, to please legalize sports gambling because I can't afford to be up in the penitentiary doing five to ten years on some weak-ass gambling charge. I always want to shout out to my homie, Demarcus Calloway, who is locked up for murder, but he didn't do anything wrong but stab a police officer, which is according to the BLM movement, is okay. It's time to get paid, legalize it, and free my homie Demarcus. Well, there you have it. Take it from Tiny, but of course, first consult your lawyer and financial advisor. That's all the time we have this week. Happy Easter. Bye-bye.